fast driving. A blame game was triggered after the government halted all trains on safety grounds, while the union claimed all their members were willing to work. Imagine Monday, no public transport. I don't know what's going on. Trains unexpectedly in an election. That was going to be very helpful. Sparking a day of disruption. Passengers turned pawns in a political standoff. This is really difficult. As the entire network was shut down. This is not a strike. We are not on strike. Workers reported for duty.
We would risk uh, trains being stranded across the network, trains being delayed for hours and hours, and customers being stranded across the network. The decision was made by Sydney Trains because of the lack of agreement. Staff waited for news while the union and government faced off at the Fair Work Commission. It's beyond heartbreaking that we're being blamed for something that was completely beyond our control. The two sides continue to fight over a new enterprise agreement. For the arrive of $100,000 a year, who one of their claims is that they want a bonus just for being doing, for doing overtime. As negotiations continue, hundreds of thousands of commuters are left to deal with the train wreck that follows. Kevin Dock, ABC News, Sydney. For the first time in two years, vaccinated visa holders can touch down on Aussie soil. Foreign family and friends are racing to visit, ready to catch up on lost time. <laughs> International business travellers and tourists are trickling in too. And those who put their Australian dream on the pole. I came here two years ago to study, and then I went back because of the COVID. For two years, Denise Allen could only FaceTime her fiancé in Cuba. I just wanted the process to be more personal. Now the start of their new life is in sight. We're almost there. I'm literally counting down now. I'm going to start on my side. Today also marks a new dawn of the international tourism sector. We are open. We miss you. Sydney put on a stunning show for the thousands of people on 27 international flights arriving in the harbour city, with more than 50 landing across the country. It's estimated that over the last two years without international travellers, the Australian economy has missed out on more than $90 billion. While today is a milestone in the recovery, it's anticipated that it will be some time before pre-pandemic levels of tourism return. Much of that love a huge rush of international guests in a very COVID safe way. I don't think that's going to necessarily happen. We'll probably see a steady increase of guests coming over time. Toronto Zoo is one of 300,000 Australian businesses that relies on international tourism. Until pre pandemic levels return, businesses are hoping domestic travellers help them do a roaring trade. Big Bone, ABC News, Sydney. Us every day. Moscow says Ukraine is the aggressor, but these soldiers accuse pro-Russian separatists of trying to draw them into conflict. Large caliber artillery is being employed, most likely to provoke us to respond and fire on their territory. The United States says it's all part of Moscow's plan. It certainly looks like Everything we said was likely to occur in, in the lead up to the actual invasion is happening. We're seeing false flag operations taking place in, in Ukraine, uh, the manufacturing of provocations and justifications for Russia to go in. I've got to help them. Russia has announced it's extending its military exercises in Belarus, leaving an estimated 30,000 troops on Ukraine's northern border. Moscow says the US is deliberately spreading fear about the drills. But Washington says their extension is another sign the Russian president has decided to invade Ukraine. You could see uh, a significant amount of combat power move very quickly down to take key. And the combat power appears to be growing. These satellite images show Russian troops on Ukraine's eastern border a week ago and then again today. The eighth anniversary of the bloody protests in Ukraine against the country's pro-Russia president serves as a stark reminder of what's at stake. Maidan Square became a virtual war zone as demonstrators demanding closer links with Europe clashed with government forces. A lot's changed since then, but the tensions with Moscow remain. The protesters who lost their lives are known by many Ukrainians as the Heaven 100. Dozens of them were killed by snipers right here on the streets of Kiev, and they're honoured around this time every year. Jana Ozira was protesting here in 2014 when things turned violent. The soldiers, just, the amount of them is just bigger and bigger every day, and this is totally opposite that Putin uh, says. It could come at a terrible cost, but people here say their country's freedom is worth fighting for. Nick Dahl, ABC News, Kiev. But they're not stopping Vladimir Putin's 
integration. On the road into Ukraine, what Russia calls pistons, convoys. Basically, President Putin needs this much muscle. Mixed in with relentless sound shelling and rising smoke. This is the beginning of a Russian invasion of Ukraine. He's setting up a rationale to take more territory by force, in my view. In Moscow today, approval is granted to use the Russian military abroad. It is impossible to predict uh, the scenario that will unfold that will depend on the situation on the ground. Sanctions so far are limited. A massive gas pipeline from Russia to Germany is built, but now won't be used. Starting in Russia, billions. Two Russian banks will link billion energy to be cut off from trading in US dollars. That jeopardizes trade and big business, which relies on using US dollars. The punishments are best described as mid range, a prick from Moscow's side, but no knockout blow. Preparations for trouble haven't stopped. New satellite images show a Russian built field hospital kilometers from Ukraine for. But we have to face the possibility that none of our messages has been heeded and that Putin is implacably determined to go further in subjugating and tormenting Ukraine. Yeah, even as the Putin is a former KGB spy who believes the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 was a political catastrophe, a humiliation for Russia when Ukraine became its own country. Ukraine is Putin's unfinished business. Who in the Lord's name does Putin think gives him the right to declare new so-called countries on territory that belong to his neighbors. This is a flagrant violation of international law. Ukraine's capital, Kiev, was built by Russians. Now the country is creeping west. It wants to join NATO. If that happened, it would receive the full military support of three and a half million military personnel from 30 countries, including the US, the UK, and France. Putin sees now as the final chance to swoop. Start first with the next on the hands, taking not just areas controlled by Russian rebels, but also the Ukrainian government. What Putin did yesterday was tear up an agreement made 25 years ago. That's exactly what Hitler did in the 30s. Putin's promising it could all end if Ukraine stays out of NATO. Tonight, American combat aircraft based in Europe are being moved close to Ukraine, a few helicopters, F-35 fighter jets. The US says it has no intention to fight the Russians, will be ready to protect its allies. In our report of the line in Ukraine and Washington tonight, first to Jeff Harry Jeff, it's getting more uncertain and certainly more dangerous. Yes, it certainly is, Mark. Uh, Ukrainians are waking up this morning, their first 24, 36 hours of having Russian troops inside their southern border. And what are we seeing? Well, more of the same. More Russian troops heading towards the UK, the Ukraine, convoy after convoy. Uh, there is a general fear that hostilities could start within the next day or so, but who really knows what's going on in the mind of Vladimir Putin and what his long-term strategy is for Ukraine. Uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky says he still believes that he can find a diplomatic solution, even so he's ordered that army reservists report for duty. Mark. Jeff Perry, thank you. Live now to Washington, the US Bureau Chief Ashley Mulaney. Ashley, who are the Russian billionaires the White House is targeting? Russian oligarchs, some of them are government officials, all of them have close ties to Vladimir Putin. Among the so-called cronies who are having their assets frozen, Alexander Bortnikov, Putin's spy chief and the head of Russia's powerful uh, security agency. Uh, then there's Sergei Kirienko, that's Putin's deputy chief of staff and the country's former prime minister, along with his son. Plus, the CEO of Russia's largest military bank, that's Peter Frankholm. Uh, right now, President Biden isn't going nearly as far with these sanctions as he could, uh, but he says that's by design. If Vladimir Putin ramps up his aggression, so too, so too will Biden uh, with these sanctions. Mark? Ashley Maloney in Washington for us. Thank you. The more money that um, we invest up front, the um, so less the heartbreak and, and the cleanup that people have to go through. Eight American soldiers have cheated death, escaping as their helicopters collided and crashed at low level on a snow-covered mountain. 
the collision stunned nearby skiers, some witnessing it all. Training on Black Horse above the Utah snow. Routine one second, the next. The <laughs> crew. So nearly dead. Oh no. The snow kind of kicked up and encapsulated the helicopters before we heard the crash. Watching for the chair there. Oh my god. Skiers Jacob Oster and New Zealander Billy Hanneran. Just as I started recording, um, they bang. The two helicopters flying for the American military's domestic emergency arm, the National Guard. As the first aircraft landed, you do see a lot of snow kick up, a lot of snow. A broken rotor on one believed to have crippled the other. The portions of the blade of the lead helicopter separated and it appears struck the second helicopter. No major injuries, the crews lucky. A sketch within an inch of their life, and for sure. The ski is lucky too, just meters away. Utah's Snowbird Ski Resort, southeast of Salt Lake City, closed the field around the crash site. Uh, uh, I'm following as a, as a massive invasion of their neighbor. Just to bring you up to date on some of the latest military action, we have heard that uh, there are tanks, Russian tanks, across the Ukraine Belarus border from the north of Kiev that have been targeted cruise missile strikes on military establishment, particularly the military headquarters outside Kiev, and there has been a lot of fighting and explosions around a number of big cities across Ukraine. But Ukraine is fighting back. The Defence Ministry says that they have shot down five Russian jets and a Russian helicopter a short time ago. Uh, Ukrainian President Zelensky addressed his countrymen. He said, and I'll quote him, he called for calm, and he said the army is working, the whole security and defence sector is working, don't panic, we are strong. Despite that, there are long queues of cars trying to flee Kiev. There are long queues at petrol stations, and we're hearing that the roads out west to the Polish border are clogged with traffic. Mark? In the bit for a second, wheels jammed in the gap. The car was eventually driven away while the bridge operator was sacked. Then your mother rolls up. That's Miles Harris from USABC and his crowd mum Sandy. The video has gone viral. 